Hi, this is Charles Kim with Tapping for South Brunswick and Cranberry, and we're here in Princeton, in Heinz Plaza, where U.S. Senator Cory Booker has just given a very, very um, enthusiastic uh, speech to support Assembly candidate, Democratic Assembly candidates Andrew Zwicker and Maureen Vella. Uh, we're going to take you back and show you some of the highlights right now. Vincent Prieto. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Come on, a little bit better than that. Good yeah. afternoon. Yeah. I came down today here from Hudson County to be here with you in Princeton because I need your help. I need good assembly people to do the good things for the residents of the state of New Jersey. And we have two stellar candidates and Andrew and Maureen, Andrew Swicker and Maureen Bella are the people that I need. When I can tell you how important it is for everything we do in the state of New Jersey that affects each and every one of you. It's so important, but when we talk about women's health, something that's so important, and I'm gonna give you just a little fact. Since 1970, in every budget, until 2010, it was funded. Chris Risley came along and it hasn't been funded. It's been a yearly veto for him and we can never override him. So I need a majority that I could get to, a veto-proof majority. There's so many good things that we need to do. We need to do earn sick for the people yeah. that work. Yeah to be able to put food on their table without having to go to work sick. That's not right. Those are things we have to do. We have right now something that I'm gonna try and override as soon as we get back, that it's about guns. And guess what? There's a bill that the governor vetoed yeah. that is for right. spongements for the police to have input and the courts have asked for this and so has law enforcement. It has nothing to do to be tied with mental health. That's a broader issue, but this is something about mental health in an issue that you shouldn't get guns to these individuals. It's the right thing we need to do. I need people like Andrew and Maureen to be part of my team. We have a lot of things that we need to get accomplished. When I see each and every one of you, the working class of the state of New Jersey, that has been crushed under this administration for the last six years, whether it's property taxes, and rights of workers that we have not been able to give you the tools and the resources. I see your mayor of Princeton here, that we are underfunding municipalities. We're not investing in education. Yeah. We're not properly funding it. And all that goes back to the taxpayers because that is direct tax increases to you. If we fully fund education, we'll do that. We need to invest in our children. These are two candidates that are going to do that. I need your help. I need you to do in these next three days, knock on doors. We need to get people out. This is important for me, but it's important for you. It's important for your quality of life, for your residents. You're gonna have two people that you're gonna be proud of in Trenton that are gonna do the people's work because they're gonna to come to the people's house. And January 12th, I will be the proudest person yeah. swearing both of them in. I wanna thank you. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. And that she and Reed will be back there in January along with Maureen and Andrew. So my speaker that I worked with and served with for a number of years capsulized all the important issues that are on the table for us, for all of us, who care about our brothers and our sisters and our children and our elderly. Whether or not it's access to health care, good paying jobs, pay, pay, pay equity, earn sick leave, whether or not it's good education, economic development, 
We care about those things as Democrats, and we care about those opportunities to lift up everybody, not just somebody already at the top. And I know that the two people that are running in this district represent a commitment to those issues. I know Andrew a little bit better than um, Sister Della here, Maureen, because he and I ran for the same office for a little bit of time. And, and we shared more issues on the same perspective than we disagreed on, you know? And so I'm just fortunate, I'm just fortunate. I had Cherry and I had Mark. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that. This is so doable. The same people that I relied upon to do analytics of behavior, voting behavior, where our vote is, what does it take to stimulate our vote, how do we find it and encourage it? Well, they're the same people that are working with Andrew and Maureen. They're smart and they're strategic and they have found that in this district, Maureen and Andrew represent the issues and their perspective on the issues better than the two people that hold the office right now. And that if the people who say they're committed, who are eligible to vote, who say they do vote, get out and vote, we have two more progressive Democratic Assembly yeah. members to help my speaker yeah. bring home the opportunities for all people. So here, just remember this. It's doable and it's in our hands and only our hands to do. So go home, make some telephone calls for them. If not, go knock on some doors for them, but knock on the right doors. But most importantly, get out to vote and get every member of your family, your church, your organization, your neighborhood. Get those people out to vote. Because if you get them out to vote, we've got an outstanding victory. Yeah. And while you're there, don't forget my, my county executive, Brian Hughes. Mercer is very fortunate to have him. God bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, when people learn about my background, they go, physics, science, plasma physics, Rush Holt, right? And I will tell you that Rush Holt, for 16 years, was an inspiration in terms of showing, when you use evidence to make decisions, how you can set good progressive policy. But I want to let you in on a secret. The inspiration on how to run a campaign and how to represent people, not just by your mind, but by your heart, is Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. And I am so proud that she's our representative. So, as you heard, momentum is building and building and building. Yesterday, at work, at the Plasma Lab, I got stopped by another scientist, and he said, I get it. Stop mailing me, stop calling me, stop knocking on my door, I'm gonna vote for you, all right? And we have been working months and months to get to this very point right now. We are right there at the edge because we have put together this incredible, incredible organization because Bonnie's right, the first thing we did was steal her entire team. So thank you for that. But to give you an idea, of where we are. During these five days that started Thursday leading up to the election, our goal is to knock on thousands and thousands of doors with an incredible organization that our campaign manager, Seth Levin, who's hiding somewhere around here. There he is right there. And his team has put together is unbelievable. So in Hillsborough, to give you an idea, the goal was to knock on 2,000 doors over the course of five days. We knocked on 2,000 doors in two days. We are knocking on door after door after door to get the word out that the time for change is now and the way to do it is with each of you and all of your friends and all of your family. We are so thankful, so thankful that each of you are here and the tremendous support that we receive from everybody. So we have just a few more short days. Please, if you haven't already, sign up, do a shift, knock on some doors, make some phone calls. We couldn't do this without you. We are so thankful. So, th so thank you very, very much. And let's win this thing.
Maureen Vella, and I'm an attorney and a former judge. I spent almost all of my life helping people who are in a very hard time of their lives. I know how laws affect people. I know what to do when I get the phone call in the middle of the night and, and it's the police calling and saying there's so, a woman who's suffering from domestic violence. I've worked with families with drug addictions. I've worked with people who need someone to make a decision on the spot. I have experience. This is not something I read about in the paper the next day. This is what I've done. And I can bring this experience to Trenton and that's what I'd like to do. I want to thank all of you for being here. It, it, it just warms my heart. We have right now hundreds of people out in the entire district, and that is just amazing to me. I'm very humbled by this process, and I'm humbled by today. I want to tell you that when it comes time to making a change, people are telling me they don't want the same old, same old in Trenton. They're looking for difference. They're looking for a paycheck that's going to go further than it did 20 years ago, and they're afraid it's not going to. They're looking for their children to be safe. They're looking for good educators in the school system. They're looking for sensible gun laws. They're, they're looking for a change right now that, that's going to be a family-focused change. And that's what we want to bring. Now, I have a team, we have a team, that has worked their butts off for months and months, long, long days. They have done an excellent job. We have been mailing you and sending more mail, sending more mail, sending more mail. We have knocked on your doors and we've called you and called you to the point where you're saying, we heard you, but we are not done. We have a few more days. Right now, right here in these last few days, we need your help. We need you to come and, and walk with us. We need you to make the phone calls. We need to get this vote out like we've never done it before because we're that close. So let me let, let us all hear you from here to Trenton and say we're gonna do it. Let's go! So look, I, I'm so excited to be back in, in a place that I feel like I, I am home uh, to support two individuals. I've had the chance to, uh, to, to meet with them and, and speak uh, about them already at another event. Um, but this is sort of one of those moments where I, I consider it an Archimedes moment. You know, Archimedes said, give me the right lever and I can change the world. And we have two candidates that uh, should they not win, I'm telling you right now, uh, the speaker will not have a veto-proof majority. It's as simple as that. If we can't win these two races, uh, I, I really am pretty confident that we're not going to have the numbers that we need uh, to begin, uh, not just to, uh, not just to overcome vetoes, because I, I like to overcome vetoes, um, but to really deal with real issues. You know, it's crazy when I'm down in the, in the uh, trenches of Washington and uh, having uh, really interesting conversations with Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and um, the uh, 40 other colleagues of mine from the Republican Party that are running for president right now. Um, you know, I think I've got this great blue state at my back. But when I watch the Republican debates and I see people bragging about mm. cutting access to women's health care and Planned Parenthood, when I see people uh, 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 talking about uh, doing things that, to me, violate New Jersey values. And so I don't care what the issue is that I've read the newspaper, there's been so many. Uh, from uh, Finally, you had some incredible success with common sense background checks. Um, but from those issues all the way to even uh, pig crates, which you think wouldn't be that hard yeah. to do in New Jersey. Um, but all of these issues show us how important this election is. And, and the great thing about it, the thing that excites me, gives me hope, is that we have the numbers to do it. In this district, we have all the people we need. It's not a matter of can we, it's a matter of do we have the collective will. Will we, the inheritors of this great legacy of activism and engagement in American politics, will we be the nation that now suddenly in this generation becomes incredibly apathetic about the, uh, the issues that matter? And that's just not who we are. The reality is, is right now, we all drink deeply from wells of freedom, liberty, and opportunity that we didn't dig. We, we sit comfortably under the shade of trees that we didn't plant. We, we have an obligation now to continue to advance on this, on this democracy. And I'm telling you what I see from the front lines of Washington is there's lots of forces trying to erode the gains that we've made 
trying to roll back a lot of the things that we think are important and think are sacred. And in these next two years, um, when we still have a Republican uh, 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 a governor who is saying so many of these things and testifying across the country uh, to things that are so out of line with what New Jerseyans believe, we have an obligation. And I know this because it affects real New Jerseyans. Take, for example, just something that you guys have tried to restore, which is the earned income tax credit. That, that is the bridge between families being in poverty and families having some security here in this state, which has one of the highest cost of livings there are. I was looking at the data for a book I'm writing about that difference between a child growing up in poverty and a child growing up just a little bit above poverty, the dramatic difference it makes in life outcomes. And therefore, the better that child does, the better we all do, and then we realize that issues like this aren't just important for some, but in a nation that's so interrelated, so interconnected, it really is about e pluribus unum, how important this is for all of us to begin to advance these issues. And that brings me to these two candidates, who I'm traveling all over the state, and, and, and Speaker, you could, I, I know you could say this to me, of all the new candidates that are coming up to run, if you just look at resumes, there are no candidates in the state of New Jersey who have better resumes than these two individuals. They're intimidating to me. Between them, they have more degrees in the month of July, for crying out loud. And, and they have experience and expertise in doing such great things, running businesses, uh, representing not, not just in the, in the legal profession, but representing those people, fighting for those people that are often marginalized or not getting the support from society that we need. We have a guy that's a lot like me. We both graduated with science degrees. He's got, you know, degrees in sciences that I can't spell, and I've got a degree in political science. I mean, it's very, very similar here. Very, very similar. <laughs> But to see these two individuals step up and, and be willing to put themselves out there, to be willing to do all that's necessary in America today to run for office, not just badgering your friends. Maureen, you talked about everybody working their butt off. Well, the Congresswoman, who is an extraordinary leader and one of my best allies, has been like an older sister to me, looks at me and she says, well, everybody's working their butt off, but obviously you're not, Corey. You gotta lose some weight, man. That butt's getting big. <laughs> She didn't, you didn't say that, Congressman? No? <laughs> I could have swore I heard it. It's just my own insecurities, then. <laughs> but the reality is, I feel so grateful that New Jersey not only has folks like this, but willing to step into the political circles. This is a remarkable thing that two people who don't need this, who are not doing it for the money, who, ha who have served already, who've given enough. If you're Jewish, you'd be like, Dayenu. It would have been, been enough uh, for them to stop at what they're doing now, but they're willing to serve. And when you get your countrymen and women who are willing to step out like that, we have to support them. It is so important. And so I just want to end by telling a horrible joke um, in order to make a point. Wow. Uh, and I know that Liz will never allow me to speak again after this moment uh, at any of her events, but I just want to tell a joke. It will make a point, I promise you, um, but uh, allow me to go a circuitous way to make this, uh, make this very important point, and then I'm done. And, and basically the joke is really an apocryphal story about a church in my community where a, uh, a pastor was having trouble with these two kids in their church that were just cutting up. These two young brothers, everybody tried to get these guys to behave. There was the, uh, the deacon that tried to intervene and then failed and the kids were still being rude and cutting up and then the head of the choir tried to get them to, to behave, didn't work. And finally the pastor had to take matters into his own hands. And so he brings the boys down to his office, puts the kids uh, uh, one, the younger brother outside to wait, and he decides to confront the young older brother, and he sits him down, this eight-year-old, in front of his desk. He sits in his desk. The eight-year-old's all disrespectful to the pastor. He's got his arms crossed, his face in a scowl, staring at the pastor. Uh, uh, and, and the pastor sits there and thinks to himself, how am I going to approach this? I shouldn't just do this the normal way that, that, uh, that, that the deacon might have tried or the head of the choir. I'm going to try this a different way. And so he sees his Bible, big worn Bible sitting on the, on the desk there. And he puts his hand on the Bible and he says in his slow baritone voice, he says, My son, I need you to tell me right now, where is God? 
And the boy's eyes snap open, his head goes back, and the pastor's like, whoa, I've got his attention. And I don't know what kind of religious institutions you guys go to, but in my church, if my pastor sees something working, he, he just doubles down on it, he keeps going. <laughs> and so this guy pulls up his Bible now, and he holds it up, looking at the boy hard, and he says, my son, I don't know if you heard me now, I want to know a... I need to know where is God. And at this point, the boy starts shaking. He's like grabbing the arm, arms, and, and he starts shaking, looking at the pastor. And the pastor now is like, oh my gosh, I'm the first person to get through to this boy. And, and so he decides to finish it off with a booming baritone voice. And the, 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 the climax of his Sunday sermons, he stands up so loud, people outside his office can hear. He raises the Bible high in the air, and he yells out with his voice. He says, my son, tell me right now, where is God? And at this point, the boy jumps up out of his seat, runs out of the pastor's office, sees his little brother sitting there and says, man, we got to get out of here. God is missing and the pastor thinks we took him. <laughs> Has Liz turned her back on me or she's still, no, <laughs> no. Thank God. <laughs> um, what's the story, the point of the story? Look, I, I remember elections passed that had horrible turnouts. And and I, I, I remember us losing pivotal, I'll never forget losing an election in 2009. And it wasn't because the Democrats lost the election. It wasn't because the other side won. We gave it to them by just not coming out. I hear all over the place, I, all of, Congresswoman knows this, I hear it all the, over the place, people saying that this is an off election. Well, we have to turn it on because after elections, people begin to ask things. Like, why are the Planned Parenthood's closing? Why are we now backtracking on environmental regulations like clean air standards? Why, why are, are we having our public schools so cut and assaulted? Why are, all these, why are they doing this to us? Where's God? Well, the question isn't where's God, it's where are we and what are they doing to us? No, what have we done to ourselves? If we don't go out and vote in this election, waking up the consciousness of our, of our neighbors, the fault won't be the other candidates. We've got the numbers, it will be ourselves. And we will run afoul of the lessons of history brought about by so many generations who evidence these understandings that faith without work is dead, or as Frederick Douglass said, that in life you don't get everything you pay for, but you must pay for everything that you get. Or like Martin Luther King said, that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It must be carried in on the backs of people that are willing to work for it, and struggle for it, and sacrifice for it. We are a great nation. This is a great community. But you don't manifest your greatness by what you say or how you pray. It's always by what you do, how you live and how you give. And in these last few days, this is a test of our community to tell our truth. And will the truth we tell be apathy and indifference or will it be engagement? Will it be struggle? Will it be service? Will it be letting our voice be heard? And the greatest way to let your voice be heard in a democracy is through your vote. And so I leave you with that call in a community with, that has produced two of the finest candidates in New Jersey. Speaker Prieto knows that. Thank God they're not running for the Senate against me. <laughs> in, a, in a community that's produced such fine candidates who are pouring their hearts out the difference in this election won't be what they do, it'll be what we do. May we work hard, may we win this election, and may we advance our state. Thank you.